Pete Best, it's such a, an absolute honour to have you here as representing someone who's le led a life as an independent musician. Can I ask you, Pete, what were your first musical interests? Well, I suppose it stems from my mother, you know, initially Mona, um, born in India. She could have been a dance band singer at a very early age when my grandfather refused to let her go on tour with the dance band. And she had a love of music. And I suppose like every kid in Liverpool, um, I listened to music, got involved with playing skiffle with school friends. Um, my hero was Gene Krupa, you know, the drumming phenomenon. If it hadn't been for him, then most probably I'd have never picked up the drums. Was, was the whole idea of being a star and watching what was happening in America, was that an attraction? That was an attraction. I mean, it was part of it. But I mean, like every other kid, uh, rock around the clock with Bill Haley, I was standing in, in line for it, you know. Um, I wouldn't turn around and say, rip the seats up, but I had a good dance in the aisles like everyone else. America had a sound, they had a phenomenon. And I suppose the biggest phenomenon that came out of there, which had the biggest impact on us, you know, as far as myself was concerned, was Presley. There were other great people, Vincent Cochran, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, but I suppose, was there, was there a feeling like that Cliff was going a certain kind of way and then it just wasn't rocky enough, so you preferred a rockier way? Was that a feeling? We supported Cliff, okay. I mean, he, he was our English, for once, of pigeonhole in him, which he most probably won't like anyway. He was our English Elvis Presley, yeah. you know, uh, as close as it could be to him. So that was, you know, it was support. You know, the Shadows were a great band. They were making music, which was, you know, good to listen to. It was in the charts. Somehow or other, right, as regards my own individual taste, it didn't live up to what was coming out of America. They had different sounds. You know, Vincent had, you know, fantastic voice, the Blue Caps. Jerry Lee Lewis was just a fantastic keyboard player. Little Richard had this wonderful voice, which you know, shrieked and yelled and, you know, broke everyone's eardrums, but my God, what a performer. And it goes on and on. You know, the list is endless, you know, it goes from there to, to Ebley Brothers to, you know, onwards and onwards. You know, there were so many which came out. But they were the people, you know, and I suppose for me, it was very much like, okay, this is what we've got in England, which is good. We support them, right? And they're doing a good job. If they were on tour, we'd go and watch them and scream and shout like everyone else. But when the opportunity came to see the Americans who came over, that was the show that we all wanted to go and see. Whose idea was the Black Jacks and how did that come about? The Black Jacks started. Um, I had no idea of actually forming a band. Came completely out the blue because initially the Beatles had performed there as the opening band as the Quarry Men. Here in the Casbah? At the Casbah. Yeah. And that, the opening night was August 29th, 1959. And there was a, a bit of a... I won't say an argument, but a, a disagreement over money uh, with my mother Mona, right? And one of the members of the band, Ken Brown, uh, who hadn't performed that night and because who the money was, problem was, my mother turned around and said he's getting paid even though he didn't play. John, George and Paul, who were the other members of the Quarrymen because they didn't have a drummer at that time, turned around and said, no, we want his money. Mo turned around and said, no. Cut a long story short, they disappeared and said, we're never going to play the Casbah again. But as history portrays, they came back, right, and played here many, many times, which is great, okay? In this very room. In this very room, you know. And what happened then was, because Ken had been very instrumental in promising Mona, so he came and saw me and he said, you know, you're interested in playing drums, aren't you, Pete? Because I'd started off like every kid in Liverpool with a guitar. Wasn't comfortable with it. Didn't seem to be my instrument, you know. And uh, I was always banging the table, pots and pans, spoons, rhythm, blah, blah, blah. He said, do you want to be a drummer? Should we form a band? So I said, yeah, sounds great. So uh, Ken went and saw Mona, my mother, and turned around and said, I've got another band to play the Casbah. So she turned around and said, who is it? <laughs> so we didn't have a name, so he looked at me and said, what should we call ourselves? So quickly I went, ah, 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 the Blackjacks. Just like right? that. Just like that. Because I'd read it in American magazines and all the other bits. It sounded good as well, you know. So my mother Mona turned around and said, well, who's in the Blackjacks? So he went, Pete playing drums, Chaz playing bass, and Billy playing lead guitar, and me playing rhythm guitar. So she went, OK. So she said, but there is a problem. She said, Pete has no drums. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
which was quickly sold. I was dragged off to Rushworth and Drapers, which was the biggest music store in Liverpool at that time. And there just happened to be a sky blue, pearl, mother of pearl, premier kid standing in the corner, shining and gleaming. Beautiful. Instant love, instant, instant love, love, you know. Yeah. Um, I went and told my mother. And you'd been listening to Gene Krupa and all these people, so you were into the drum. Oh, very much so. Yeah. I mean, you know, plus the fact, I mean, I think a lot of it was, you know, my mother's rhythm. You know, a lot of people turn around and say it's genetic, you know. I say, yeah, it is. A lot of the rhythm stem from her, you know, but of course I'd grown up with the Air Eastern influences, which was very much Latin American music during the war. So I was very used to Latin American rhythms, plus the rock and roll rhythms. So when I started playing, it was a com combination of all these rhythms, you know, which, which worked out well for me. Was it a passion for you quickly? I mean, did you, with Ken and, and Chaz, did you kind of think, okay, this is it, I'm going for it? Initially, yeah. I mean, it was something which, okay, you'd never dreamed of being a performer, but then you were, I won't say thrown to the wolves, but, you know, you played your first performance in the Casbah. And that, I suppose, was the first impression you had of adrenaline flow playing in front of a live crowd. What was that like? Brilliant. Because it was like you were playing in front of a crowd which appreciated your music. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't the case of you played and it was like, oh, you rubbish, get off. Yeah. You know, the crowd was turning around and saying, this is great. Yeah. You know, so that adrenaline flow and you were doing something which was enjoyable for yourself, creating enjoyment for the kid. Um, and showing, you know, you're another band which tended to be, you know, could be reckoned with, you know, on the Casbah band scene. Yeah. Um, so all those things were working for you. And it was a case of, you know, you strive and then, once you've been bitten by that bug, Suddenly. to keep improving. You know? And what was the Casbah scene like then? I mean, obviously your, your mum was the entrepreneur. She was the one who had the idea of the club and she was encouraging t teenage music. She was like a, she was there be before Brian Epstein or, or, or Alan Williams and all these people. Well, as she was aptly named by the media many years afterwards, you know, Mother of Mercy Beat, and she was. I mean, she had this fantastic foresight, which was to bring live music to the kids of Liverpool. It happened in this, you know, humble abode called the Casbah, you know, which is now, you know, the number one tourist attraction in Liverpool, you know. And maybe that isn't said enough that um, Mo Best was kind of the Mother of Mercy in that sense. I think that's worth saying. It is, because I've always turned around and said, um, no matter what interview I do, she was an unsung hero as far as I'm concerned, and the family are concerned. I mean, she started something in Liverpool which was unheard of in a way. She took a coffee club um, and provided live music initially one night a week, which was a Saturday. Then she turned it to a Saturday and a Sunday. And then, it, you know, the audiences grew, the, the membership grew. Um, that she was bold enough to turn around and say, we're going to have live music seven nights a week. Wow. And that, 1959 and 60, for a venue was unheard of. Yeah. I mean, a suburban you know, venue. Suburban venue, yeah. yeah, because we're not town centre, you yeah. know, we're three miles outside of town. I mean, yeah, other people were doing dances one night a week, yeah. you, know, or, you know, clubs would be there, but they had DJs on, yeah. not live music. Yeah. So all their ideas came to fruition. Most of the major bands in Liverpool played here, okay? Uh, to name a few, The Searchers, Big Three, Jerry and the Pacemakers, King Size Taylor, Domino's, Beatles, goes onwards and onwards. Did the Quarrymen play here? They did. So Not the first lineup. The lineup then was Ken, John, uh, Ken Brown, Paul McCartney, John Lennon and George Harrison. Okay, no drummer, as I mentioned before. Yeah. And it was very much a case of, they had an amp, right? If you could call it an amp, it was like a tea toaster. It was a Watkins, you know, it was about that big, right? And everyone plugged into it. <laughs> Incredible when you look back, you know, I mean, this is 1959. But it was amplified, you know, guitars. And that was the sound which started off in the Casper. 